All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kamstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider subscribing on YouTube or your favorite podcasting app. This will help me reach more people. In this episode, I'm joined by Scott Deedles. He's the CEO of Block Rewards, host of the Block Reward podcast and the author of The Dow of Bitcoin Towards a Cosmology of Energy Money. This book is a spiritual exploration of the energetics of money, manifestation, and a bullish dive into why Bitcoin's fundamental principles are in harmony with universal law. As someone who's very interested in Gnosticism, I'm super excited to talk with Scott today. So uh, yeah, welcome, man. We, we finally made it. It took us some time. It sure did. Thanks, Bram. And uh, that was a really cool description of the book. I, uh, I'm like, that, just listening to that, I'm like, wow, that sounds like a book I'd love to read. So thank you for that. Well, steal it. Use it, use it to pitch it. <laughs> I will. Yeah. So I wanted to start with, with a primer uh, about the book. So in your book, you, you argue that Bitcoin is a form of money that naturally fits with the principles of Taoism, which is an ancient Chinese philosophy that emphasizes living in harmony with the natural order, which they call the Tao, right? It mm -hmm. offers a solution to the problems created by, by our current financial system and promotes a more fair, stable, and harmonious way of managing and using money. And by embracing Bitcoin, we can all align more closely with that natural order, leading to, to greater fulfillment. This is how you and I see the future. But when I look at the current state of you know, the minds of the general public and our connection with nature and universe, I sometimes feel we are currently very, very, very far away from the, the Tao place that, that we could describe as something that we would want to attain. Like, what, what is your view on that? How far away <clears throat> are we from achieving that? Well, they say sort of the, uh, the night is always darkest just before the dawn. I think that... Uh... The, the point about Bitcoin being money that emerges naturally as a result of being in alignment with natural law is the opposite of is equally true. And that's sort of what got me starting thinking about these ideas is that fiat money and central banking are an unnatural, uh, you know, s sort of set of rules that have been imposed on us. And it, and it forces us into a way of thinking that is equally unnatural. And it, it's so it's been going on long, just long enough. I think that it, it's difficult for for the people who haven't really d dive in deep into Bitcoin ideas to um, take a step back and and think about the absurdity of so many basic aspects of our society and how things have have evolved as a result of this sort of fiat money thinking. So. Uh, but I think that, you know, Bitcoin, uh, for people who have already made a transition in the Bitcoin uh, ideology or, you know, the multiplication of the total number of Bitcoiners, we, we have a roadmap to see how this thing could change a lot faster than people think. And I personally, I talk about this in the book. I do think that, um, you know, we're not talking about months or probably a, a, a time scale that would be seem fast to a, an individual person. But if we think about sort of the, the time scale of a collective, collective consciousness or a, a species level, uh, you know, we've been using money for thousands of years. And so uh, if it takes 10 years or 50 years for this Bitcoin thing to happen at a, at a, at a humanity level, um, that's going to feel, I think, very fast for uh, for us as a as a civilization. So uh, I, I guess it kind of depends on your answer to the question of uh, for Bitcoiners. You know, I feel like you're probably the same. It can't happen soon enough because we can see how cool the world looks on the other side of all this with people just imagining interacting with each other in a completely different way. And uh, but it's it's yeah, it's probably going to take a little bit longer than than we want. Yeah. Yeah, I love what you said in the beginning. I I see it as the same thing, right? Like when I hear Christine Lagarde say, you know, we have to tame the the beast of inflation or like inflation came out of nowhere. I think like no, you n not necessarily her, right? But people created that, you know. And I I think if you're not honest about that from the start, then you're going to talk in these you know, weird descriptions of it came out of nowhere, but it's like you're not taking responsibility for the for the system that was created and that you are you are maintaining. And I think that that is one thing. And, uh, and, and another thing of fiat money is like, 
lots of people feel that or act like the world is um what's the word I want, I want to say like man, manufacturable or something, right? Like, oh, if we have the money or we print the money, then then we can fix this thing. So it's all about not looking inside, but the, everyone is focusing on on the on their outside, right? Either they're pointing to other people or they say like, well, this this money thing, we can just make more and then we can fix it, because, fix a problem because we have money, right? It's everything is so externally focused, whereas you know if you if you make the connection to bitcoin and what you said you know it probably won't happen in our lifetime what we are all envisioning i'd say maybe maybe even two three generations further right um we are trying to practice what we're preaching which is that long term time frame right and i think for me that's one of the uh i'd say like um hooks where I go to, okay, that is why it's a bit more spiritual, right? It's not, you know, the, we're doing something for people that we don't even know yet, hopefully. Right. And, and that is pretty far away, but we are trying to do that work for the, for those people that are not even, uh, born yet, which is, I think a total opposite to, you know, fiat money, um, yeah, yeah, Psychology. fiat fiat money. I think it, you know, it it only knows how to steal. The, the the fundamental underlying principle of fiat money is theft, and so participating in that, or you know, when you're talking about Christine Lagarde, you know, they they can't help but contemplate ideas and solutions that are rooted in theft, because when you're creating that money out of nothing. Uh, you know, there, there is no, the, these are like fundamental laws of creation, right? Like you, you can't create yeah. something out of nothing. So it, it's, it's coming from somewhere else. Uh, you know, like we were, um, there was some outrage. I live in Canada and there was, uh, you know, some of the different foreign aid projects that we commit to sending money to, which, which is great. I'm not against foreign aid, but it's like, that even the, that is like a, a non-consensual dilution of the purchasing power of, of the money and how it works here so that it can be sent elsewhere. That's a, it's a transfer of wealth that it was sort of involuntary. And, uh, and so that, that just, that just baked into how the system works. And then when you drill it down to individuals that so you were mentioning about sort of the, the material nature of solving all of our, uh, problems with, um, you know, dopamine hits and, and instantaneous gratification that I think that's sort of the trickle down effect that that's the end result of having this kind of melting ice cube money. We, we, we all, we all are aware of it on some level and we can't help, but, uh, you know, we, we exist in this world and I think it's, it has a, such a powerful gravity that, uh, that's part of the, uh, sort of the the absurdity of it is that we're all sort of swept into this vortex of mm. of spending money before it becomes worth less so that like you know you spend it now because if you if you don't tomorrow you'll be able to buy less stuff with it so it's like this this crazy um you know system of like of uh, of infinite everything and i i uh I, I, I and once you see it you know it, it's hard to believe that everyone can't see it like we, we can't have the productivity of the world measured in in infinite growth when we're also measuring that infinite growth with a, a, a measuring system that's also growing infinitely like, like th yeah. this is a spiral to infinity and it, it is just totally senseless so that that's the part you know i i, I just um you know i two three generations like we'll see because i just i can't imagine that it's going to take the rest of the world you know another 50 years to figure out what, what a handful of people can have figured out in five or 10. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, Bitco, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, 
insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet. I've been using mine for about a year now and I love the design and ease of use. And with Foundation's mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. The Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app or any of your other favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a microSD card and is built with 100% open source hardware and software. I love what Zach and the team at Foundation are building and to learn more about their mission, please check out episode 27 of this podcast. If you consider buying a Foundation Passport, you can use code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, to get $10 off at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. I, I definitely agree with that. I just think like it's, I think it illustrates how big of a battle this is, right? Like also what you're saying, people are focused on spending their money, right? They're consuming and not they are not building, but also I feel like the the why question got the, diluted a lot, right? Like, and, and we'll talk about your book, but I think eventually the the why question like why am i here <laughs> why does it work like this you know <laughs> what am mm -hmm. i here to do so um th th people don't ask that question anymore they they just are stuck in that in that behavior and i feel like the more people get stuck in that behavior it's also harder to ask the why question right because i think the 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 longer you wait with asking the why question the more anxious you'll get in asking and answering it right because uh, understanding what you're trapped in and i mean I, I was there too i always say say that right i think a lot of bitcoiners were there too in general everyone is stuck in this not only the fiat money system but the way of thinking that comes from that right it's not a nice realization to realize that you are participating in a system that you don't understand that's designed to work against you that doesn't give you the opportunity to eventually build towards the future right and and that's why i also asked that fir first question like how far away are we like i like i don't know like i love these examples from history where in uh, is that rhodos in greece i think if i say it correctly like they had these huge statues right at the entrance of the harbor for example um, and people were proud in building that and showing off etc like i at least in the western world you know that that we are from i don't see those things anymore for example and so it's it's very very in individualistic and very consumer driven which is i think also why we are so far away off um you know the Tao in 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 this sense. Yeah, you know th this is part of the basis for the book because I do think that uh, one of the most um, you know destructive side effects of this theft money system is that it really does make it difficult for people to think in a way about interacting with each other in the way that we're really meant to, and yeah. you you do see this. Um, you know, in, in parts of the world where people still really live a, a traditional lifestyle that isn't based on, you know, monetary accumulation of stuff, and uh, they're much happier, and the, co the communities are much more cohesive, and uh, they, they don't know these things. Uh, so that, so that this, is an, this is like a, a pattern, a thought imprint that has been, like, pr impressed upon us as a uh, it can be, it's been learned. And so I think it can be unlearned. Um, yeah. You know, Taoism is about um, sort of separating the the rational and the intuitive. And Taoists think, uh, sort of seek like a, a non-intellectual experience of reality that can be uh, obtained through sort of meditation and, and different states of consciousness. And so I think of uh, part of the similarities between Bitcoin and Taoism in that it's an inward journey that starts that starts sort of uh, uh, on the inside of somebody. And that that's something that can happen to individual people one at a time. And that transformation uh, happens, happens individually. And then those people 
as a result of how they sort of then turn outward and interact with each other kind of multiply. And, and these, yeah. this is very similar for, for Bitcoin and Taoism. It's a, you know, the, the light just goes on and all of a sudden you're looking at the world totally differently. How you spend your time, how you, um, you know, the people you want to talk to, what you want to talk about, and even things like this, like how you look at architecture. And uh, I never really used to care all that much about it. Me and neither. now I drive around and it's, it just drives me insane. Like, yeah, yeah, we think we're the most advanced civilization in human history, but like, there's just no way we, we could build some of the buildings that probably, you know, where, where you live, you would see some of the most incredible feats of uh, human design ever created. And they're staring us right in the face. And there's just no way we could make them today. And yeah, uh, yeah. it's 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 really that I, I, I have given the example a few times I live in a hundred 20 year old house i think and like oh well, you see the door behind me right like this is not like a, a a four plate you know pressed wood type door this was a solid piece of wood and and a carpenter was even like oh I, I i should make it like a bit more pretty like not flat right like they had time for that <laughs> you know mm -hmm. and i, I agree I, I never also looked at at um, like buildings like that or just i i feel like we we take all these things for granted, you know, like history is history. It's very far away. That's not now. Um, you know, it's not tangible. I think, I think that is what fiat money drives us towards. Like, like not only consumerism, but more like the, the, the tangible stuff. Like I need to feel it. I need to see it. Only then I believe it. Right. Like, but I think that comes from some sort of, I don't, yeah, I don't know, like insecurity or anxiety or, or something of not not wanting to do that inward journey like being distracted by all these outside um how do you say temptations basically right uh, whether it's stuff or you know whatever people consume now to not to not do that inward journey yeah i mean i, I think it has to do with this uh relationship between uh our, our personal, uh, our physical time in this world is finite. It's the one thing that's finite for each of us. And what we're really doing when we're earning money is transforming our time into monetary energy. And we're using money to store that energy. So what we're really doing is storing our time. Yes. And time is really, truly the most precious thing we have. And so, uh, you know, when we are forced to use a, 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 an energy, a battery for that time that steals from us, there's an, you know, it's like we all understand that that time is flying and on some level, right? So the the really insidious aspect of this is that because it's a one way ticket, money only becomes less valuable over time. It means that our time is stored more and more poorly over the, the course of our lives, right? And yeah. I think that that because there's no end point to how much of your life could be wasted in terms of your ability to store it that your, your time, the value of your time is compressed infinitely, you know, squished down less and less and less. And this is why I think we see this, you know, sort of devolution of, um, we used to watch, you know, um, programs that were an hour. And now then it was like, you know, short videos, you have a YouTube channel, you can see like the average person watches a YouTube video for like seven minutes. And then, you know, it's TikTok is like 60 seconds. And if you don't actually have a, a good TikTok, the a person will only watch it for like six seconds. And, uh, and this is yeah. to me a symptom of this mentality of like, of course, we don't have the time to turn inward and really think about you know, our place in the universe and our position in society and how we're meant to be with each other, because we, we just don't have an effective way to store our time. And so all we can do is sort of make our best to, to spend that time uh, in a way that is going to give us some gratification, I think. And this is why all the buildings look like garbage and uh, why we have no sort of like, you know, disintegrating cultural boundaries and uh, civility, like literally every aspect of this is completely interconnected, which is also like a, a core concept of Taoism. Taoists believe in the interconnectedness of all things. And I think that, uh, that this is one of the greatest aspects of the hoax of fiat money and central banking is this notion that this is the way it is. And it has nothing to do. This is what Christine Lagarde saying is, you know, we're, we're going to tame this beast like it's some kind of, um, 
unknown so, entity. Like, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, and and it's and it's uh, I I I don't use the word malicious a lot, but talking like that, you know, for me now, so I don't have a finance or economic background, but I think like last four years or something, I've been really diving into this, and when I look at this as just like a rational random guy, right, and I hear someone like that say that, I think like either you are malicious or you have no clue. Both are very bad, right? There's mm -hmm. no in in between middle explanation for for acting like you know a inflation is not a direct result of the policies that she signs off on right like it's just i don't know but i think you said it correctly i can only think about these things or think about you know what does it mean when someone like that says something like that because i was able to create the time to think about that you know and i i think this concept is very important to to talk about more because I think we talk a lot about, you know, what is Bitcoin? How does it work? But what is the effect of adopting Bitcoin versus sticking with fiat money? Right. And I think one of the main things there is when you get rewarded, even if you get rewarded in fiat money, but you, you know, transform it into Bitcoin, then you can save the reward you got for your time and energy, right? Energy expended in time is your productivity, is whatever you deliver with your, your job or your venture. And by saving it in Bitcoin, you are able to create that time towards the future to, well, basically do whatever you want, right? But I think what we're talking about here is that how, how, how that, that new space invites you to go on this self journey in a sense right and ask these why questions like why does money work like that you know why is it designed against me why should it you know dilute uh, um, or devalue with two percent each uh, each year like what wh why who came up with that right and i think just most people do not have that time or are not even aware of the fact that they could create that time for themselves right like mo most people are surviving obviously you know, and but I think like it, you know, when presented with the the two options, and this is partly why the book you mentioned it's it's I feel very optimistic and bullish. Nobody, if given the choice between having their time stolen or preserved uh, for the you know the eternity of their physical life, would would choose the first option. Like nobody. Yes. And so, really, in my mind, it's just a matter of helping people as many people as possible understand this idea, and then at, at, at some point, enough people will understand it that it won't matter. Because people are just intrinsically wired for wanting a brighter future, both for themselves and for their for their for their kids, right? And like everybody who has kids wants their kids to have a have a better life than they did. So this is a simple decision. It's just um, it's just something where at this point in time where it's not obvious for people, but I feel like yeah. that that's inevitable because the human the human spirit is uh, is wired for hope. It just is. Yeah, I agree. I, I think, you know, this is this is why I like kind of, uh, you know, uh, thinking about this, like it, it could go quicker than we think. Um, so I'm optimistic, too. But it's more like I feel like we are we are in general very far away of, of being, you know, more interconnected and stuff. And I feel like it has to go really down bad before people are kind of like urged, you know, I think we did it voluntarily, you know, this inward journey. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Which is a different experience. I think than when you are kind of like urged or forced to do this because you have a real problem, you know, but I think uh, I talked to, for example, Tony Yasbeck. I know, I don't know if you know him, but he was, uh, he's from Lebanon. He was really rich. And then from one day to the other day, he had nothing and it was all gone. And he, he told me like, yeah, you, you, you cannot even imagine or fantasize about how that feels because you, you are just smacked in the face with, well, knowledge, but also, you know, you become mad, uh, mad at yourself. You're, uh, you know, just hurt in the fact that you didn't think about what am I participating in before, you know, and th that's when he turned to Bitcoin more uh or, or or like totally right but uh yeah i i i i hope most people don't need it need something like that but unfortunately i i do think they do
Yeah, I mean, I don't think we have like two or three generations to figure this out because the rate at which currencies are devaluating in the West is accelerating and, and people are expecting things, money to behave over the next 30 years the way it has over the last 30 years. And they, they think this way because of the sort of disingenuous conversation around getting inflation back down to two to three percent. And it's like that. The message that they're trying to convey to people there is that, you know, things are going to become affordable again. But that's entirely not true. Mm -hmm. uh, pr prices, you know, it's, it's nonlinear, like prices maybe will fluctuate a little bit. But the trend over a long enough period of time is, is one way. And, uh, and the, the debt levels are, are just sort of getting to this point where it, it's just mathematics, right? So um, I, I can't, I can't see, I, I wonder about this, like, it's almost like they, they know, they must know on some level that this is <laughs> eventually not going to work. And there's some kind of a plan for what happens after that, because I, I can't think that they're so clueless that they really have no idea what they're doing. Like that, that explanation to me, it's too, it, it's too crazy to even imagine. Yes. I, I have the same hope, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would expect that there are um, intelligent enough people who are open enough to realize that, that this is a real problem. Um, but so if we if we move to Bitcoin, how what I what I liked in the in the book, you know, if you think about, you know, if 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 Taoism seeks to align, you know, human life with natural order, when where Bitcoin comes in, at least from how I see it after I read your book, is because Bitcoin is so predictable and the protocol is so clear, you know, we know what's going to happen, you know, we we know how the protocol works. And first thing I had to think of is like, well, we also know how a tree grows, for example, or how certain plants grow or fruits or, um, you know, vegetables, whatever. And so because you have that knowledge, you can, you know, fill in your time with, for example, growing your fruit or, um, you know, harvesting grains to eventually make bread or, you know, like back to the basic level, basically. And bec because it is predictable, you can become a little less unsure about the future of your life, right? So because for everyone, the future is uncertain. But if we have certain tools or instructions or information that give us some, some order at a certain moment, we can create, you know, less or we can lower the uncertainty about the future because, for example, we can create our food or we can preserve our food, etc. But when we, you know, and that food is obviously the most important thing, but when, you know, in a, in, a, in a global economy and civilization, when we talk about the most important thing, it is the money, right? Because it is a communication tool between, you know, two parties that exchange uh, value. So my view on this, why, you know, it connects for me in the book is because Bitcoin is so predictable and we know, you know, there's a, there's a there's a fixed supply that's enforced that it's that is um, you know verifiable etc. It gives us that certainty towards the future and basically invites us to adopt it now so we can you know move into that future with more certainty than the than the current fiat money system. Which, as you alluded to before, you know that if, if that is the measuring stick for value, yeah, the measuring stick literally change changes every week <laughs> you know uh, definitely every quarter you know yeah. um and so i wanted to ask you how how is that a good explanation or is there something you would you would add to that yeah so so you mentioned uh you know it's a medium of communication i also really think that it, it's a money is a uh, is a system for exchanging energy. And I, I talk about this in the book. It's the idea that we're, we're uh, you know, what's cool or where, where there's an alignment and connection with Bitcoin and, and reality is that we're exchanging sort of, we're, we're literally exchanging energy because energy is intrinsically involved in the, in the production and operation of, of the Bitcoin network. But we're also, you know, as we've transformed our energy and time into value, we're really exchanging our, our personal energy with each other. And so, you know, like if I have to physically uh, do some labor to create a service uh, or a, a product that, that you're going to buy from me, you're buying it with, you know, with money that you have 
pre previously transformed your time and energy into, right? And yep. so, so it's an energetic exchange. And uh, I think about like um, the, the, the fiat monetary system, if we're thinking about it as a means for, for moving energy around the planet, it's an inefficient network for moving energy because, you know, in a, in a chemical process, you're moving energy <clears throat> and there's a byproduct of heat. And, and so some of the energy is lost through that system. It's an uncontained system, right? So in, in Bitcoin, what we're really doing is permanently trapping that energy inside the system. Now, there is no uh, leaky uh, by, byproduct or, uh, you know, process that, that drains away the effectiveness of the exchange. And, and what that really does is, is it hypercharges the connectivity of the planet because now we have this super efficient way to connect each other. And again, it's, it's sort of that like two level process where, you know, the, the, the exchange, the literal aspect of the exchange is fair now. And because there's no, there's no theft embedded in that, there's no uh, drain of, 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 of heat, um, we, we can, you know, interact with each other sort of assuming a fair exchange. And that's the part that I think has just become so cool because when, when we can have uh, fixed parameters around an exchange of value, now all of a sudden that's, that's sort of the basis for this like, you know, fair interaction. Like I, I think it just completely rewires the way we think about that interaction in the first place. And uh, so, so to me, it really does come down to this idea of like Bitcoin's uh, efficiency in exchanging energy that makes it so cool. Well, I think you're muted. What a rookie mistake. <laughs> uh, I love the illustration. I, I think it was from Sailor, but I don't know. But like if, and you said leaky bucket before, right? Like currently we have, I see our current fiat system is like, I don't know, like a globe, but it's, it's, it's leaking everywhere, right? And so within this globe, a 3D globe, everyone is connected and that's where we exchange this energy as you mentioned right but be, because the globe you know sometimes it shrinks sometimes it gets bigger N not the uh how do you say like the, the 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 energy within it but it's more about like how how it how is it diluted for example but with bitcoin i see like a cube like a 3d cube that never changes size and all the human productivity goes into that cube and within that cube, we measure our human productivity in Bitcoin, right? So that's the measuring stick. And we know we can verify for ourselves. No one has to believe us, right? It, the entire point is that you can verify for yourself that that cube of 21 million little cubes, you know, stays the same all the time, forever, basically. And that that is also the incentive for everyone who's using that value or money system to never change that because then we have a constant to value energy or the human productivity and and therefore the price of you know whatever well, price i don't like price the word price but uh, the the value of each unit will grow and grow and grow because more energy from all the people in the world will come into this 3d cube that's not gonna change in in size basically that's kind of how i visualize you know how how all the energy is eventually uh, uh, captured in in Bitcoin, which again makes it kind of like predictable for the people exchanging energy with each other. As you said before, if if you do something for me and I give you a reward that you don't want to spend right now, but maybe in three years, it, it should be valued at the same level at least, not less, and definitely not on purpose less. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and if if you don't have to worry about the fluctuating value of the money, then you can really just think about the, the exchange. And that's what money should yes. be. It should just yes. be a 100% efficient tool for us to, uh, to, you know, uh, facilitate more complex um, uh, barter, you know, forms of exchange. And so I think that, uh, to me, that this is why, you know, money should be sort of like a natural process. It should just be something that we don't even have to think about. It's uh, we're, we're all going to have stuff and, and create stuff and want to exchange things. And we just need the, the simplest form, the most sensible way to do that. And that's really what enables that, uh, you know, inward, uh, you know, preservation of our time. And I think like it all comes back to this idea of time. Like this is why we don't 
build these beautiful cathedrals anymore. It's because it's because we don't have any time. We don't have any way to properly, you know, if you were thinking about a construction project that you thought might take a hundred years, well, how would you possibly ever imagine how to budget for that project at the rate at which our money is yes. changing value? It's impossible, right? Very so, so we have to think about these, you know, construction is just such a great example where we have to think about things on short term deadlines, because even we've really seen this over the last three or four years, every construction project that started in 2021 had to come in extremely over budget because the, the input costs of materials, you know, tripled, whatever. And so, um, so it, it all of the, 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 uh, the degradation of money and the leaky energy forces an, uh, a never ending compression of short term thinking, which is just a colossal disaster for any kind of civilization that's trying to endure uh, successfully over the long haul. Like, so that, this is why I think all of the sort of like larger, you know, social decay that we're witnessing right now is just intimately interconnected to um, this this theft money that we're uh, that we're sort of like watching, you know, play out. Yeah. Well, and, and because it's it's crunched, right? The, the value that eventually gets delivered with products or services also goes down, right? I, I, it actually takes us further away from what my understanding is of capitalism, right? Like if, if the reward is fair and hard and constant and predictable, and I want someone to create, you know, a door for me and I have three, four people that, you know, propose a price and uh, give me an example of what, what they could build for me, then I will probably choose the person that delivers me the best value or, you know, my perception of the value that they're going to deliver uh, to me. But if I have a reward that's, you know, devalued every day, if I use fiat money, then I want to get rid of the money really quickly, right? And the the people proposing to me, you know, the doors that they could make, they will probably try to compete on price, for example, and then I go with the lowest price and then, you know, I don't have a pretty door like that anymore, but just like a simple, uh, you know, pressed wood or whatever. And so I think also the, 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 the quality of the things that are created, the products and services that are created also degrade over time which is also some sort of loop, right? Because yeah, well, why, why would I try to become a carpenter or, you know, a, uh, a Mason or what, whatever. Yeah. I mean, and I, th I, I think we, c we can't underestimate the disastrous impact this has on a society because we are absolutely the products of our physical environment. And so when you are in these, you know, if you've ever walked through like the Duomo in Madrid, you can't help but feel a certain, sense of uh you know this sort of like uplifting and you know um nobody would ever vandalize something like that or nobody in their right mind but uh when yeah. when you're and when, when you're in areas like that right you you just experience a different sort of like internal feeling of you know all, all the good things and uh the reverse is also absolutely true i think that as we as we continually build these like crappier and crappier things um we, we're just that our, our bar for, you know, culture and civility, all of those things just just also get crunched. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I want to live in this, like, golden era, you know, like, I think we, we sort of like, we manifest the world that we want to live in. And the, even with part of the book, I, I want other people, I would love to have as many people as possible thinking in that same way, too. Like, why not? Why can't we collectively start dreaming of a brighter tomorrow? The uh, the period before the thirty year period before World War One, so like eighteen eighty five to nineteen fourteen, uh, the inflation level over that entire period was like one or two percent. So like over thirty years, the price of everything basically didn't change, mm. and uh, that's like a period of great prosperity. You know, uh, many you know, world changing inventions. Um, yeah, like we, we just, it absolutely works. We, we just need to, uh, we just need to get this money thing like sorted out. Yeah. I, I'm quickly Googling, uh, earliest skyscrapers. Mm. I, I think, I think that is a, that is an interesting example. I, I'm going to see if I can read real quick, but like, you know, lots of skyscrapers were built in a few years, not 
tens of years, right? Or not even more than five years, for example. And now you see simpler buildings or designs or or projects that take way way more money, <laughs> even adjusted for inflation, and way more time, right? I I I, lo I just love this. I think if you turn this into a question, as you also did before, right? Like, do you think we should be quicker and more efficient in 2024 compared to 1924 uh, or not, right? Most people will say yes, but the reality is the opposite almost. And that's, I think, a nice leeway into a why question, right? Like, why do, why do you think that is? And yeah, it's just, again, I don't want to be, uh, I'm not pessimistic, but this is again something where I think like, ooh, you know, like a hundred years later, we should be more efficient and it should be cheaper and quicker, but we are not. And, and that, you know, I give the example of, you know, in 1924, the bread was probably 20 cents. Now it's $4, you know, which side do you think is winning? You know, that is an illustration of, of the problem that, that we have. But if we eventually want to get out of this, right, how do you see kind of like the integration of these spiritual concepts like, like Taoism and, and financial concepts how can they be a bridge and if so how how do you see that so so i think that uh this this thing that's happening with bitcoin and i i truly believe this this is a a, a natural immersion of um things sort of shifting towards the way they are meant to in in alignment with natural law and I, I don't think that Bitcoin is any more repress, repressible over long term than uh, than like the ocean would be. And you know, the, these things are just going to do what it's going to do. Like we, we're we are meant to um, we're, we're just meant to interact with each other in a certain way. And I think that 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 will emerge and bubble up whether we whether people attempt to prevent it or not. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that really the the root of it is this this uh, the reason why the the principles of of Taoism have have endured over these thousands of years is because it's it's just sort of a a series of observations about how the how the world works like how procedures in nature unfold when when things are left to sort of the the natural law and uh and human interaction is is no different like we we're we are a part of this world we are subject to these same natural laws and so i think that uh that, you know, that this is um the, the theft money system is is rooted in in the control of the many by by the few and that is also just i think not the way it, it's just not supposed to be that way and yeah. uh it makes sense that those people would try to prolong that system as long as possible, because if you were in charge of that system, you, you probably would be doing the same. But I think that like, um, Bitcoin, what, what it has going for it is this unstoppable competitive advantage because money that is meant to, um, benefit the, the users as opposed to the creators is, uh, you know, it's something that benefits the many instead of the few. And so yeah. we, they, they, you know, it, it's, a, it's a question of, of, of numbers. And there are way more of us that are suffering as a result of broken money than aren't. Yeah. Yeah, it makes so much sense, right? That, that yeah. we should move towards something like that. I had to think when, when you mentioned before, you know, uh, you said natural law or I, I, when I read the book, I was thinking more about you know, also universal law. I I don't know if, do you know the Kibalion book? Mm -hmm. Yes. So when you just mentioned, you know, like it's, it's a natural occurrence, like one of the, the, the Kibalion book is about the, the universal principles uh, or, or laws of the, of the universe. Right. And one is the principle of rhythm. So everything flows in and out back and forth, right? Like, like a pendulum, but also everything, uh, the principle of vibration is like, everything is, in motion, etc. But also, uh, I, I wrote this down before, but like the cause and effect, you know, the, this created fiat money is the is the cause and we are living through the effect, but it will also result into 
into eventual change. You know, if enough people reject it and move to something else, to the other side of the pendulum swing slowly, right? That, that I think that does give me personal, personally, it does give me hope because I do believe in, in these principles. And I think that's also what, uh, what we are seeing. So there is more than just the, the rational approach, you know, just asking the simple questions and be like, you know, do you want stable money or unstable money? You know, do you want to save towards the future or not? Like those are rational things, but we are also guided by something that, that is, that is bigger than us in, in that sense. And I think that's a very positive angle to look at Bitcoin from, because I think we talk a lot about the problems <laughs> and the negative effects, right? But eventually the future is so much, um, so, so much brighter. And I think that is why people say Bitcoin is hope, you know, or Bitcoin is optimism. Like that is, that is where we're moving towards. But I wanted to ask you, like you, you, um, you had a talk recently that you also shared uh, on your account and you said Bitcoin is synchronizing human consciousness. Is that then kind of like also what we're talking about here? Like event slowly people are moving towards that same direction of change and basically one by one, maybe we, you and I now reach one other person that starts, you know, following that journey too. Is, is, is that what you're talking about there? Yeah, I mean, I think hope is a magnet, first of all, and mm -hmm. uh, it's a magnet that becomes more powerful with the more, you know, if we're thinking about the, the power of the collective consciousness, the more minds that are aligned to this concept, the, the stronger its, its gravitational pull starts to become. And, uh, you know, getting back to sort of what you were just saying just before that, I, I think that... Um, it's easy to, with Bitcoin because it's a sort of newer technology to spend a lot of time talking about the technology and how it works and, you know, um, mining and what mining is and uh, how transactions are validated and how is the network secured and all, all these different things that are sort of like innovations. And, uh, you know, this is what people want to understand when they're trying to make sense of like, is this thing going to be enduring and is there something going to be better than it? And all these questions. And it's like, we, we spend, so we spend a lot of time wondering about the, the, you know, how Bitcoin works. And I think that we could also benefit from spending a lot of time thinking and talking about why it works. And this is sort of that idea of it, it is more in, in tune with a lot of these older ideas about, you know, it's really almost lost knowledge of just understanding some basic fundamental principles about how things work these, you know, like, like you were talking about the, the laws in the Kyba the Kybalion, like this is, this is just how it is. And so, um, yeah, I, I think you can, you can sort of get around to it both ways the, in terms of like the, the, the talk of Bitcoin synchronizing human consciousness, what makes it cool when you were talking about this idea of the cube, I think about this cube concept too, because Bitcoin is, uh, because of its uh, fixed principles and unchanging rules, it makes it it makes it an idea that everyone can understand. Like th this is the beautiful part about it. It's like we can all look at this thing from ev from a every different direction, and we can see the same thing. Yeah. And it might be the first thing where we're able to do that, right? Like it, it's absolute truth. It's just um, so we can we can what I what I really think that. It represents is Bitcoin is a new uh, paradigm for forming consensus around something because we've we've never really had the opportunity to properly agree about something absolutely as a species, and if we can agree on one thing, then I think that's also a, a pathway for us to replicate that and and understand uh, species level consensus can happen on multiple things. But the first thing we need to agree on. The first thing we need to form consensus on is the notion that theft money is stupid and we need to stop doing it. And that uh, how we can how we can get there is by coming to an agreement on a on a system of money that makes sense and is a sensible way to value um, the everything everything in the world. So so that's why I think we we synchronize our consciousness first by helping people understand that there is this sort of like non-tangible, you know, three-dimensional object in cyberspace that we can all sort of stare at and manipulate and rotate 
and ponder on. And, and after enough time, we'll, everyone who does that will we'll sort of come to a, an agreement that we, we're, we're, just, we're seeing the same thing. We, are, we all have access to the same information, to uh, the, the transparency. And, um, and that's, that's, a, that's a, the first step on the path to, uh, yeah. to a different civilization. Yeah, I, I think I, I shared with you before, like I'm, I'm, I'm writing this article that I want to title something like the Bitcoin is the standard measurement for human productivity. I, and uh, other people told me like, yeah, it's the same like the, the meter or the second or the hour, right? But it, that also gives us a certain baseline truth or also understanding that other people understand what it means, right? And so therefore you can... Uh, communicate about it and i love also the example of what if the the size of a meter constantly changes every quarter you would have really you know weird houses you also cannot plan on you know building building things with a changing um a measurement stick, uh, stick and yeah you just said uh you said uh, uh ultimate truth right and mm -hmm. i i also i love that expression because that is also, one of the things I think we can use as an illustration for people is like, okay, the meter is agreed upon. Well, not in America, <laughs> in England, right? <laughs> but in general, <laughs> you know, that's the standard measurement for, for, for distance, right? And we have a standard measurement for time. Those are, I would want to say, elements of eventually doing something with, but the communication... Uh, of value between people um, is, is is also something like that, and it is very important because we are not bartering anymore. Well, in in a different way, right? Um, but the fact that we don't have that, I think it is in line with time and and distance measurement. And once we can show people that it is engineered truth, you know, it's ultimate truth, but it's engineered ultimate truth. Why is it engineered? Yeah, because it's not, well, the concept is a natural phenomenon, but the the fact that you can verify it, that it, it's something that's created and you don't have to trust the creator or anyone who talks about it. You can verify for yourself that this is always the same thing. And therefore, I think eventually it could transform in that standard measurement, that ultimate baseline truth that you can trust when you also actually use it, right? But therefore, you do need to reflect on what am I using right now? And I think that's what we talked about before, that that is just something that, yeah, most people just don't have time for. Like, what what is money? Why do I use it? When did I decide to use it? Or am I forced to use this money, right? Yeah, and this is why I think that the sort of triangular relationship between time, energy, and money is so interesting. Because to me, the other real application for Bitcoin sort of becoming the, the metric system of value is... Um, with, with energy. So it, one of the craziest things that happens today is that energy producers sell their energy, like, you know, oil producers are selling oil, something of real value. The entire world runs on oil and they're selling yeah. it for paper, which makes yeah. complete, not, you know, like that makes no sense. So of course you should have, you know, the, the value, we know how much energy is produced by consuming a barrel of oil or producing a barrel of oil. It's the same input output as mining a Bitcoin block. You know, so there's an obvious and direct relationship between the price of energy and, in Bitcoin. And I yeah. think that uh, because it doesn't make sense to be settling the price of energy in gold because you can't move gold. Gold is not teleport. You can't teleport gold anywhere in the world, but you can move energy at the speed of uh, Bitcoin and vice versa. So I think that uh, and it won't be just oil, right? Will, you know, nuclear energy every sort of uh, the production of energy as an input and, and an output measured in Bitcoin just makes too much sense to not do it. So I, I think this is one of the things that will really radically shift the, the human thought paradigm for Bitcoin as a metric system of money is when some country and uh, it won't be Canada because we're um, racing towards becoming a third world country here, but uh, some Middle Eastern country will first, I think, start accepting uh, oil deals done in Bitcoin. And all of a sudden the light bulb will just go on. Like, why would you not trade energy for energy money? Yeah. 
again so rational and simple i love it i mm -hmm. i i my assumption is that some uh, i agree on the arab country as a as a serious next uh adopter but yeah exchange energy for energy it, it makes way more sense than exchanging energy for something that was created out of nothing which is yeah it's 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 just a dumb exchange it's not smart right yeah uh, i mean and it's but, like but again the rational thoughts don't always win nowadays, <laughs> nowadays yeah. so we are we're in a different world but what i love is uh, you know you you talked about also the understanding of taoism eventually produces change in a person then you know in their thoughts and then in in their actions i think we clearly see that uh, with bitcoin as well i mean we are talking here mm -hmm. on on the podcast together um how how even so eventually you know it's kind of like a mind virus more people study they understand they are invited to take action inspire more people etc how do you think widespread adoption of bitcoin might lead to societal uh, changes in societal values or or behaviors over time like what are things that that pop up for you if we if i ask that so you know i think about this question of like what what is the tao of bitcoin and it's uh to me it you know it's it's many different ideas but one one of them is it is a a feeling of tranquility that results from a comprehension of energy money. And what that means is, uh, you know, I think that when you have grasped this sense of the capacity to preserve your time, you can really take a, a deep exhale and a, and a pause. And, uh, and, and that is the start of that inward journey that, that changes someone's, you know, outward journey. So this is why I think for, for people who really get Bitcoin, whether they get Taoism or not, they're already embodying those behavioral changes because you can't help but but connect these concepts. Like people who really get Bitcoin do start living their lives differently and they do it in a way that is filled with this sort of general, uh, I would say, uh, shift towards more optimism, more, uh, you know, like uh, feeling of community. This is the reason why Bitcoiners seek each other out and why people will tune into these podcast is like, you already know lots about Bitcoin, but yet you're still going to make an hour of your time this week to listen to this. And, uh, and I, and I just think we're, we're in the hyper early stages of this is like, the idea is that everybody wants to have a brighter future. Everybody wants to live in a culture where beautiful things are being built and their, their work is being valued. And we have time to genuinely interact with each other and form meaningful relationships and personal connections. And all of these things are possible. And I think what Bitcoiners just do is start sort of like emanating uh, a conviction about these things. And I'm sure that you've been this person too at a dinner party where it, you know, the conversation comes up and you just can't help. But it, you know, it's frustrating for people who don't understand it. But, but it doesn't, it doesn't ever sway you because you've just understood it. It's not an opinion anymore. It's sort of an internalized, uh, gnosis. It's a knowledge of, uh, this is something that is happening. It, it's possible. Um, anyone can, anyone can participate. This is what I love about Bitcoin is like, you know, it's a weird idea, but anybody can understand it. it it's not that complicated. And so. Um, I, I think part of it is we are just living through this period in time right now, the 2020s, where it's gone from a very fringe idea to we're starting to see the early phases of this mass transformation of consciousness. And uh, this is sort of Parker Lewis's idea about gradually and then suddenly. And it, it will it will, in my mind, very much seem gradual until the moment that it isn't. And, uh, and then that's how it goes, right? It's like, th this is how intellectual revolutions percolate is, uh, it will, yeah. it will seem like it's taking forever. And then one day we'll just wake up and we'll be like, holy moly. And everyone gets it. This is amazing. Yeah. So how do you view the relationship between meditation and manifestation and, and human action? I mean, our thoughts become actions and actions become markets eventually mm -hmm. i think we can you know manifest bitcoin into the future um i i think i said that before you know like i think we are like embracing 
the uncertainty that that new knowledge gives us today, right? So be, because we we took this orange pill and we step into this new paradigm and we look at that old old paradigm, and yeah, when we are at dinner parties and we are the only weird person that keeps talking about this, you know, other thing. I love what you said. We internalize this knowing, right? It's not an opinion because you studied enough, you know, and, and the conviction is built not upon suggestions by other people. It's built upon your own study and your own self journey and your own self reflection. So eventually it's something that is explainable. Also, it's not, I think Bitcoin does this and this, but you can actually make it tangible, I think for people and, and eventually turn it also into rational questions, right? But we have to embrace the uncertainty now to work towards something that is, well, we, we, I think we, uh, we different in, you know, how long it will take, but some, somewhere in the future. Um, like how, how, how do you see that with that manifestation? I just feel like I learned something last week. Also, I don't like it when people say, you know, Bitcoin is inevitable. Well, I used to not like it because for me it implies like, yeah, well, if you think that and you stop doing things to educate other people, you know, or, you know, in what, in whatever way, then no, it's not going to happen. But then someone told me, yeah, but if you say it's inevitable, inevitable, it's also a sort of manifestation, right? Mm -hmm. And if you believe it's inevitable and you keep going, yeah, that's the perfect manifestation to, um, or well, for Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I say, I think it is inevitable that people want to help each other, especially if it's not going to be detrimental to themselves. So if you can help others, and it will simultaneously help yourself, that that is inevitable. And uh, so so that thing is uh, a very powerful, probably the most powerful motivator of change. And, uh, and manifestation is that we're, we're all wired for this anyways. And, uh, I th you know, I think ultimately manifestation is uh, the process of making choices that move you towards a future that you want moving towards you. So we make these decisions and we, we create a future that uh, we create the desired outcome as, as a result of those, of those thoughts becoming actions. That, that to me is, uh, and so I think that if you combine sort of those two things, right, you think about people figuring out that they can help other people while they're simultaneously helping themselves and those people imagining a better world and a brighter tomorrow, that this is what Bitcoin is. And this yeah. is why, like, you know, I feel like you're the same. I've completely rewired my entire life. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm going to spend the rest of my life doing. And, and in my mind, like we, we are just going to recruit more and more people and we're going to will this reality into existence because I want to live, I want to pass a better world on to future generations. This is like, to me, the, the most meaningful way somebody could spend their life. And, uh, and I know I'm not alone. Like I, we, we, there are a lot of us and many people will, every, everyone to me is a, is a pre coiner. Like, uh, it, it's just, a, they just haven't had the right conversation at a dinner, at a dinner party yet. Yeah. Yeah, I, I uh, yeah, well, won't, won't surprise you that I agree, but I think it's interesting that it's, um, I don't know how it feels for you, but it uh, for me, I, I sometimes said, like, it feels like altruism or something, right? Like, I, I, I genuinely want to help other people understand, and yes, I, I will get value from that, as, as do you, but I think that is eventually the paradigm shift that in, in, in a fiat world, it's everything is a zero sum game. Like if I win, you lose, right? And in Bitcoin is a mutually beneficial system where, yeah, as you said, if, if, if you adopt it, you know, I helped you and you, and you helped me. And, and that I think is also part of what is the paradigm shift that, you know, sometimes I hear myself talk and I think like, yeah, this does sound too good to be true. <laughs> you know, it sounds like a snake oil salesman, but it's because it's, I feel like what Bitcoin can eventually help us achieve is something that we not even dare to think about now. We cannot even fantasize or, or imagine, uh, you know, fantasize about it or imagine it because somewhere deep down, we don't believe it's attainable and 
I think once you start thinking about why do I think like that, you know, who made me think like that? Is that something that, you know, I woke up with some, <laughs> someday or, you know, is it a result of, of the system that I participate in or, you know, however you get to answering that question, I think for most people, at, at least for me, the question was, I'm participating in something that I don't understand. What do I actually think about it? And I think that that was like the the inviting the question that invited me to to go on that path. Like, okay, I don't know. I feel stupid. I should research this. And then when I researched it and I found out how it works, I just felt like an idiot. And that was a that was a good trigger for me to feel like that. You know, be like, okay, I I think I'm not an idiot, <laughs> but I'm acting in a <laughs> in a stupid way. So I, you know, there's something I need to change. And I think that um, finding some sort of uh, um, reward in just realizing that, you know, and also realizing, you know, that you don't know everything, having that humility to be like, okay, I'm an idiot and I don't know everything, but I want to figure it out. I think that, that, that will help a lot of people, hopefully, you know, I think, I think the, the, Feeling like an idiot is a good trigger <laughs> to, yeah, to yeah, stop totally. doing things. Yeah. You know, and I, I think like getting back to what we were talking about at the start of the conversation about architecture, if you really think about it, the, the signs are everywhere that people have lived in a better time. Like it might not be in a time of iPhones, but uh, it was certainly um, a more beautiful time, a more uh, a time where people really valued um, craftsmanship and quality and aesthetics much, much, much more than now. And, uh, so, so that I think is, it's staring you right in the face, depending on where you live. I've, especially if you're in living in Europe, right? It's like, this is, uh, should be for us a, a little bit of a wake up call that things can be very different. If, uh, if we, we, we could think about things in a very, very different way. So I think it's part of this um, idea about acknowledging that, you know, yeah, we, we, we've all been a little bit duped by the system and, and people don't think about it that way. And I think that's why we can look at buildings that took hundreds of years to build and are still the most beautiful masterpieces in the world and convince ourselves that we are living in the most advanced civilization right now. Like uh, there's a there's an intellectual disconnect there that only makes sense, be, almost like because we, we probably don't want to admit to ourselves that on some level things might have gotten worse. And uh, because it's, it's not really, to me, about the immediate pleasures of the now as it is about how it would be to live in a world where everything was intentionally made to be beautiful like that's just uh yeah you know there, there would be no comparison between those those two things yeah i mean if if you walk at a place well you mentioned madrid or like sagrada familia in barcelona or 16 chapel right like it's like your 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 spirit lived way beyond that physical life, right? Because that thing that you help build is still there, and other people are using it and looking at it and being inspired from it, right? I think that is kind of what you're talking about. That just realizing that is, I think, what could give you purpose in life, and also give you like that hope or enthusiasm to work towards the future, to achieve something, to build something, you know, like yeah. not, not the short term gratification, but uh, yeah, more like long term, not suffering, but pain or work, right. To have a longer term impact on, on whatever you're doing. Uh, yeah, I think one example, I know you have a thought, but I wanted to give you one example. Like in the city I live in, they were, um, there was like this uh, this intersection and, and there's like a canal there and they're like restructuring it with a new bridge, etc. It's almost finished, but it takes like three years or something. 
And then there's these barriers around it, right? Like there's a fence around it because they're working and there's like these banners that are on there. And one of these banners says like, uh, we are working here, you know, like some children don't grow up to be lawyers or doctors. Some people want to, you know, work with their hands or something, something. And so uh, sorry for the inconvenience or something like that. And when I saw that, I was like, man, this is so sad because they are building a bridge that's, well, hopefully going to be there for a hundred plus years. I could never do that. Like, mm -hmm. how cool is it that they are building a bridge, you know, in an historic center that's going to be there longer than they will probably live, you know? And I don't know, for me, it was kind of an illustration of not, not seeing the value in that anymore. Like the fact that you have to defend that you like building stuff, <laughs> what, <laughs> you know, like it's, it's a bit sad. Yeah, I mean, and I think about the the real sort of like, you know, those masterpiece uh, buildings that are, you know, hundreds or thousands of years old. And it, and it's almost like, or, you know, the pyramids of Giza. It's like, this is the most permanent representation of the storage of time that we can observe in our physical world. And those yep. people who are involved in creating those things really did um, turn their energy and effort into something like, you know, not eternal, but as close as we might possibly be able to do like that, that is the most efficient store of human energy that existed before Bitcoin. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I think ultimately, yeah, I'm just like having this idea for the first time on the show, like it, it, it at the end of the day, it, it is about the ability to store our time and energy to, to pass it forward to to future generations and i think that maybe that the ability to do that is what causes this uh cooperation and hope and a uh, sense of community yeah humanity so, yeah so what do you see as the as the most significant challenges in in aligning current economic practice with taoist principles I mean, the, the obvious biggest problem is that the people with the most money are the ones who have the most to lose. And uh, in particular, I think that Bitcoin will completely disintermediate the way we think about government today. And I talk about this a little bit on the book. Most of what we do with government is based on stealing money from the citizens. Governments only exist to confiscate wealth and control. And uh, that, that's the current incarnation of every government. It's just the degree to which that they do that. And they don't, it's actually become so ingrained and systemic that governments don't know how to do anything other than steal and control. And so, uh, it, you know, nobody is going to be less interested in a change in the creation of money than those who only know how to be in control. And, uh, you know, government should be about being public servants. Like they, they it should be about uh, improving the quality of life, of the people who live in, you know, the area that you're serving. And, uh, that's, that's just fundamentally not true of the way of the way governments work. And, uh, so I think that that is absolutely the biggest obstacle. And for that reason, I think that Bitcoin represents a, um, the first domino in what will be a, a cascading effect of decentralization. And I actually think we're, we're sort of witnessing the, the last stages, and I don't know if this is going to be five years or 50 years, but I, I don't think we're going to have in the future um, giant nations anymore. I, I don't think that makes sense. I don't think that it's necessary. Um, I, I think that we're, we're going to, because Bitcoin sort of dematerializes the, the physical, the confiscation of physical wealth, it's, uh, it makes war a lot less uh, you know, financially viable. And so protecting, uh, protecting land and, 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 uh, and resources and wealth is a, a big reason for super state governments to exist in the first place. So in, in, a, in a sort of a post-war world, I think that uh, super states will be, be a little bit obsoleted. And so I, I'm imagining a, a, a decentralization will occur that is also, you know, um, part of an, a natural order of things where we, we're sort of meant to exist with each other in this more harmonious way. And I, and I think that the first step really is fixing the money problem. So that, that might be a long answer to a, to a short question, but um, yeah, the, the answer is I think our 
change is a natural part of of the universe like the Tao, Taoism is about sort of like procedural you know uh, it, things don't cycle around and start over it's it's procedural in that they it's a constant spiral of change towards something new we're always changing and evolving towards something different and i think that you know the last sort of hundred years maybe really starting with the world war one was has been an era categorized as sort of the the peak of centralization everything became increasingly centralized over the last hundred years plus and i think that's given most people on the planet the impression that centralization is like a reverse corkscrew that gets tighter and tighter and only goes you know like to the centralization of everything like so one day google is the world's government i don't know i i, I think that's uh, i don't think that's the way it's going to go i think that it's yeah. much more like water building up pressure on a dam and eventually the dam starts to crack and then it uh and then it just crumbles and the water is is free to flow in the way that it's meant to so yeah. i think that uh the first thing we're going to decentralize is money and this is that idea about synchronizing human consciousness when we've done that when we've shown everyone alive a paradigm for how to come to consensus and agreement on rules and things that make sense and then we'll be able to really look at government and say like you know what this doesn't make sense either and what we should be able to do is establish a system that is consensual and based on rules and uh fair and once that happens then i think we can really start to tackle you know subsequent problems i think it's uh but we'll see yeah, I, I think the illustration of uh, water is a is a is a good one because eventually, you know, you cannot ban Bitcoin, you cannot stop Bitcoin anymore. Like it's it is like water in that sense. And when you just uh, talked about the super states, right? Like I thought, like okay, is this does this blow up in like a war scenario or not? Or like how how is that going? But I also feel like. And that's why I like the, the global game theory discussion, right? Like, I think you can also, it, 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 if you can get to a point as a country where you have certain leaders or people in, in certain positions that that see this, what we are talking about, you know, like you, you, you can actually build the best country in the world, in a sense, because if you invite people, if you adopt the hardest, most fairest money, and you invite people to help build a country. Just as, just if one example exists, you know, I think for well, Bukele in El Salvador is trying to do that. Then it exists; it's already there, and people can see the difference between their country and you know any country that um, adopts this different philosophy and this different type. Uh, of money and i i like that idea about the game theory that eventually the repression in in super states or you know big rich countries will will grow once there are more options to escape to right and uh, and that i think will accelerate at least the awareness of i think everything we t we just talked about right like the the, the acceleration of asking that why question why is this happening <laughs> mm -hmm. why, you know why why should i stay here what is this state that also consists of you know all these individuals by the way which i also think is interesting to, to think about but you know why does it exist how does it exist for me you know why should i contribute to it if it if it doesn't do anything for me and if there are other places that you can go to and most importantly you can take your economic and the economic energy that you gathered over your life, then you can go. And I think that is a, a big idea that's far away for people. And I hope we don't get there, but it could very well be that we get there. And I think that's why Bitcoin is the lifeboat, right? Like if we get there, then that is the lifeboat that, that you can take. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. So how did your how did your personal journey into Taoism or Bitcoin evolve when when you wrote the book? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I uh, had been studying Taoism most of my adult life. And so when I understood Bitcoin, I was really making the comparisons between the two very early. And I, I, I mentioned this in the book. I think that 
Um, you know, Dallas ideas helped me really uh, become more bullish on Bitcoin as soon as I really made sense of it. And um, Bitcoin ideas have definitely made me made it easier to be a better Taoist because I do truly in my daily life sort of experience this ambient sense of uh, calm because my my wealth is safely stored. And, uh, you know, I've been working in the traditional financial system my entire career and navigating accumulating wealth in the fiat world is incredibly complex, even if you have, you know, a, a background, a career in it. And uh, I feel like I've comfortably been able to exit that entire game. And now I spend my time thinking about the people I want to spend my time with and uh, the quality of my relationships and my experiences. And so, you know, th those are all sort of things that, that enable me to, um, experience this, uh, you know, physical world for its fullness and beauty. Like I, I really do live my life in a very, in a very present way. And, uh, and that has a very much to do with Bitcoin. Love that. Yeah. I, I think this is the perfect summary of how, uh, how the view on life can change once you, once you adopt Bitcoin, right? It's uh time, time slows down in that sense. And you are way more, way more present you know I, I yeah i love that were there anything uh, any any things that were like unexpected when you wrote the book any discoveries or insights where you were like okay i haven't i haven't encountered that before that's a good question um <laughs> more you know i i was mentioning offline uh i really need to go back now and uh write sort of a second edition at some point. And I, I think I definitely will, because if anything, there are things that I've actually sort of realized after sort of rereading the book or, or going on podcasts like this and talking about it more and uh, ideas that I, that I want to now incorporate into the, uh, into the message. So that that's on my list to do. And, uh, I'll, I'll get there at some point. A V2. That's right. Nice. All right, last last question, and I ask everyone the same question, which is, what is a core belief that you will never let go? Uh, what is a core belief that I'll never let go? Actually, th this is a Taoist principle that I live my life by, which is uh, never use a word as a weapon. So uh, I talk about this a little bit in the book in a different way. It has to do with the idea that sort of violence invites violence. And... Uh, this is a principle that I took up uh, a long time ago uh, after after uh, some intense Taoist study. And uh, so I, I am very careful with my words. And in my daily life, I, I never, uh, you'll, you'll never catch me say something that, that could uh, sort of intentionally cause harm. And that's a, that's a core belief that I will, uh, will uh, keep with me until the day I die. Nice. Well, thanks so much for your time. And, uh, and this great conversation. I, uh, I will link to your profiles and the book and your company in the show notes so people can follow you and check out uh, what you're doing. And uh, yeah, man, appreciate your time and uh, thanks again. Thanks, Ram. This has been a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, check out some of my other episodes to learn why Bitcoin is the most important subject you must understand and adopt. If you want, you can follow and connect with me on Twitter X. I'm at Bram K, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you have any feedback or questions, just reach out. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for our next episode. Thanks for listening.